To endure is greater than to dare. To tire out hostile fortune. To be daunted by no difficulty. To keep heart when all have lost it. To go through intrigue spotless. To forego even ambition when the end is gained. Who can say this is not greatness? Those words were written by William Makepeace Thackeray, favorite novelist of the late George Phileas Vanier, 19th Governor General of Canada. Thackeray's words were written before George Vanier was born, yet they stand today as a eulogy to the greatness of a Canadian whose courage, sacrifice, and devotion taught his countrymen new meanings for words like love and patriotism. A man for all Canada, a tribute to General George Vanier. In 1965, General Vanier told a group of students, Canada has an enviable name in virtually every country in the world except one, our own. It was not enough that he'd played a major role in shaping Canada's world image. He wanted his fellow Canadians to know and to understand how the nation was regarded by other countries. His heroism in World War I, his impassioned recruitment efforts in World War II, the various posts of his diplomatic career. His lifetime was lived with dignity in such a way as to bring honor and respect to his country. He was proud of Canada because he loved it, not with chauvinism or the shallow philosophy of my country, right or wrong, but rather with a genuine affection for people. In his view, it was the people, all the people, who made this land what it is, whatever it will be. Unity was his most serious concern. He once said the measure of our unity has been the measure of our success. Listen to these words. We are French Canadians, but our country is not confined to the territory overshadowed by the citadel of Quebec. Our country is Canada. It is the whole of what is covered by the British flag on the American continent, the fertile lands bordered by the Bay of Fundy, the valley of the St. Lawrence, the region of the Great Lakes, the prairies of the West, the Rocky Mountains, the lands washed by the famous ocean whose breezes are said to be as sweet as the breezes of the Mediterranean. Our countrymen are not only those in whose veins runs the blood of France, they are all those, whatever their race or whatever their religion, whom the fortunes of war, the chances of fate, or their own choice have brought among us and who acknowledged the sovereignty of the British crown. The first place in my heart is for those in whose veins runs the blood of my own veins. Yet I do not hesitate to say that the rights of my fellow countrymen of different origins are as dear to me, as sacred to me, as the rights of my own race. And if it unfortunately happened that they were attacked, I would defend them with just as much energy and vigor as the rights of my own race. What I claim for us is an equal share of the sun, of justice, of liberty. We share and have it amply. And what we claim for ourselves, we are anxious to grant to others. I do not want French Canadians to domineer over anyone, nor anyone to domineer over them. Equal justice, equal rights. Cannot we believe that in the supreme battle, here on the plains of Abraham, when the fate of arms turned against us, Cannot we believe that it entered into the designs of providence that the two races, enemies up to that time, should henceforth live in peace and harmony? Such was the inspiring cause of confederation. 
No, those are not the words of General Vanier. They were spoken the year after he was born by Sir Wilfrid Laurier. There's perhaps something almost prophetic in the fact that when George Vanier was only one year old in 1889, only 12 years after Confederation, the issue of the day was unity or the struggle for it in Canada. The French-English hostility was a continuing thing even then. It was more than a difference of flag or religion or philosophy. It had long since passed those stages. It was a creed, blind, unreasoning, and futile, just as it is today. It is puzzling, even confusing, when we realize that even the very personal sensitive issue of religion didn't begin on bad ground. There were gestures on both sides. When Quebec was ceded to the British, the Jesuits willingly provided their chapel for religious services by the Fraser Highlanders, Presbyterians. When their own services were over, the Recollet Fathers lent their chapel to the Anglicans. Whatever contributed to the tensions and hostilities in early Canada is unimportant. In the words of General Vanier, to emphasize now our quarrels and shortcomings leads only to bitterness best forgotten. In a typical example of his deep concern for humanity as a whole, and for the part he felt his country could play in serving the world, he said Canada owes it to the world to remain united, because no lesson is needed more than the one our unity can supply. The lesson that diversity need not be the cause for conflict, but on the contrary, may lead to richer and nobler living. A building, growing, living Canada, full of the sound and fury of change and development, the sound of jets and satellites, computers and electronic impulses, bleeping a shrill centennial symphony. This is the Canada of today, and for tomorrow, General Vanier said, through unity, we can build a future which will make the progress of this century seem pale by comparison. The sounds of today are the sounds of challenge and progress. But what are the sounds of yesteryear? The turn of the century sounds, some of them long gone with not so much as an echo left behind. Consider the loving sounds of a lifetime, sounds of the past. The clean, clear ring of a blacksmith's hammer making music on an anvil the hiss of a horseshoe dipped red hot into a tub of water. Iron rimmed wagon wheels on a wooden bridge rumbling like summer thunder. The clank of whipple trees and the creak of harness, the crisp snap of a buggy whip and the sound of horses hooves in a dust filled street, pedestrians on boardwalks. Shop bells that tinkle a welcome when the door is opened the squeak of a winch on an open well, and the clunk of an oaken bucket striking moss and stone as it rises on a rope. Pump handles and dippers and the whir of a magneto crank on a wall telephone. Click, click of brass money cartridges that zipped crazily around the dimensions of department stores and shot out of pneumatic tubes into wire baskets. The wafer-thin cover of a pocket watch snapping shut. A steam engine panting in a siding like an asthmatic giant and the long, sad wail of its whistle as it chugged along the rails. Rhythmic pounding of mallets on tent pegs when the circus came to town. Angry whine of electric automobile, shake and rattle of Stanley steamer. Squeak of stylus on school children's slates. Thump of butter churn. Scrunch and clatter of rock salt packed in the wooden tub of a freezer for homemade ice cream. Horseshoes on cobblestones. Rasp of kitchen matches on a big sandpapered box. Song of sleigh bells and hiss of sled runners on downtown streets. Groan and squeak of a square rigger leaning against the wind. Click and slide of parlor curtains on wooden rings that sounded like a gypsy's bracelets when the curtains were opened or closed. 
beautiful small boy delight sound of a snowball against a stovepipe hat, clatter of curling tongs and heavy clink of stove heated irons. The clang of a Hudson terraplane changing gears. Only one of its kind in all the world sound of a Model T's door closing. The earthquake sound of bison on the prairies. The sound of cherry wood whistles. The sounds of Canadian entertainment. Plunkett's dumbbells. The happy gang. Fiddler Joe. Jake and the kid. All the sounds that are gone, or nearly gone, or forgotten. The sounds change and change again, yet some remain constant. The sounds of love and happiness that nothing can change. The laughter of little children, and the sound your own front door makes when somebody comes home. The sound of sea on the coast, and the breeze on the lake, and the soft whisper of the Chinook, and the small patter of rain on a rooftop. These are the sounds that a hundred, no a thousand years can never change because they are the sounds of home where love is. They are the sounds of people, all the people who make home. They are the past and important only because of fond memories they recall and good times spent with good people. But like all things, they must fade and go. These sounds really have nothing to do with the good old days. General Vanier said, don't speak to me about the golden age or the good old days. The good days are those we are living in. Not yesterday or tomorrow. The past is dead and the future uncertain, but the present is young and alive, full of urge, and it's ours. A time in which we can do our share for God and man. I'm happy to live in this age and I envy you who are younger than I, who will live in the next 50 years to witness and to take part in the struggle between the robot and the soul. General Vanier admired the poetic works of Byron, Shelley, and Keats. It was Byron who said, the best of prophets of the future is the past. Perhaps that's why he placed so much faith in God and neighborly love. The world, he said, has become a giant robot urgently in need of a soul. A robot with a gigantic body, rather imbalanced and out of hand, undisciplined in its movement and on its way at a terrific pace. Can we control it if we do not succeed in giving it the spirit based on love and faith? Even with this kind of questioning, he belied any pessimism. Science has sent missiles up, but ethics and morals, we can agree, have not left the earth, he said. I believe we must shape our lives on moral standards, personal as well as public, higher than those which exist today. To those who claim that his kind of faith was an intangible, too vague to offer any reassurance, he said, Are you sure it was nothing more than coincidence that for something like 100 years weather conditions had never been so favorable in the Channel? There were hard-boiled sailors, soldiers, and airmen who were there. They thought Dunkirk was a miracle and they weren't afraid to say so. The jet sounds, the computer noises, the sonar bleeps, and the roar of traffic in Canada's cities and on our highways may seem harsh and alien to the sweet nostalgic sounds of yesteryear, but they are the sounds of progress, and to future generations able to keep abreast the rush of achievement in the space age, they will perhaps be recalled wistfully and evoke memories of a time when life was more quiet, but mankind was less informed. Despite failing health, despite his years, or perhaps because of the wisdom the years brought him, General Vanier was able to keep pace. The marvels of technical and scientific development were to him tools that offered betterment for humanity. Achievements in the field of communications he saw as a means of bringing Canadians, indeed the world, closer together in an exchange of information and ideas through which understanding could be realized. In his view, understanding was the sure key that unlocked whatever doors led to national unity. But unity to him was not just some kind of 20th century umbrella under which Canadians could huddle and tell each other they were united. General Vanier had no time for those who would reduce unity to what he called a monolithic conformity. 
He felt it should be founded on a sincere appreciation of the diverse backgrounds of all the people of Canada, the kind of unity that would add color and variety to the Canadian scene. Through divisions, he warned, we will promote our own destruction. He described the boundaries of some provinces as sometimes looking more like barriers than meeting places. Let us open the windows and the doors of the provinces, he said. Let us look over the walls and see what's on the other side. Let us know one another, and that will lead to understanding. It's ironic that in this centennial year, Canada should lose George Vanier, one of her great patriots. Prime Minister Lester Pearson described him as indeed the good and faithful servant. In a cable to the Queen, he said General Vanier was a great Canadian, a devoted servant of his sovereign and his nation, and above all, a man of humility, courage, and dedication to duty. For all his ability and willingness to keep up with the almost daily rate of changing conditions and circumstances in life today, there were some things he drew from the past. Again, it was Thackeray who said, Mother is the name for God in the lips and hearts of little children. General Vanier was deeply concerned, not only with the family as a nation, but with the individual families of Canada, their homes and their relationship under the strain of modern living. During his tenure as Governor General, he inspired the founding of the Vanier Institute of the Family. The organization is dedicated to the study of modern family life and how it's affected by the increasing complexities of today's living. He once told fellow Quebecers, Spontaneously, freely, let us do more than our share. He was always first in the ranks of those prepared to do more, offer more for their country. Opposition leader John Diefenbaker noted, he died on duty. Today, the state funeral for General George Vanier will, at the request of his family, be of an inter-service nature. Boy Scouts across Canada will observe a one-minute silence for the man who was chief scout for eight years. Thousands have filed past his casket as he lay in state. Young, old, many who knew him personally, many more who did not, but loved him nonetheless. They saw on the maple leaf flag which draped the casket, his general's cap, his sword. They saw the velvet cushion at the foot of the casket with its gleaming symbols of his sovereign's recognition of his gallantry and courage in defense of the land he loved, the distinguished service order, the military cross and bar, the legion of honor, and the badge of the famous regiment he founded, the beaver insignia of the Royal 22nd, a unit whose battle honors reflect the bravery of its soldiers in two world wars. General Vanier once said of the Royal 22nd, I have never been more proud of my French-Canadian patriots than when I have seen them face to face with death. What epitaph is befitting such a man? Is it enough that we are grateful for his service to his country, 50 years of his life in peace and war? In the words of Lord Byron, Seek out, less often sought than found, a soldier's grave, for thee the best, then look around and choose thy ground and take thy rest. Perhaps his own words tell us more about him and give him more tribute than we can ever pay him. In one of the last, if not the last, telegrams he ever sent, dated March the 4th, General George Vanier said this to an organization concerned with the welfare of mentally retarded children. There can be no surer test of our humanity than that illustrated by our attitude to those less fortunate than ourselves. A man is never so great as when he stoops to lend a helping hand. Inasmuch as you have done it for the least of these, our Lord reminded us, you have done it unto me. In this age of automation and individualism, it's a striking paradox that the world is coming to renewed realization of a simple truth forgotten since the Middle Ages. The truth that the mentally retarded while deficient in some respects, have almost always some special endowments from their creator not given to other men. Whether the endowment be a greater sensitivity, a larger capacity for affection, or simply a more innocent simplicity, the retarded as a child of God is often closer to his creator in some respects than we are.
Those words say so much for the man who wrote them, General George Vanier. They tell of his own humility and his love for mankind. To hear them is to understand what Prime Minister Lester Pearson meant when he said, General George Vanier was in truth a man for all Canada. The greatest tribute we can pay General Vanier is not in word, but in deed. It is to accept and to make a reality of the challenge he left us. During his years of office as Governor General, he repeatedly asked that Canadians put aside their petty differences and make Canada great. These are the words of his first speech as Governor General of Canada. In speaking to you here in Toronto, capital of the province, I wish to say how important, how rewarding it is for us from all parts of Canada, from the east and the west and the vast area in between, to visit, to see, to know one another. And thus only shall we appreciate the virtues of each. In every province, in every man, of whatever race he may be, there is some good. Our duty is to look for that good. Let us extend the hand of welcome. In Canada, because of its immense area and different cultures, unity is essential. We cannot get on without one another. We must find a basis of mutual understanding. Let us give an example in all walks of life of solidarity based on the heritage and the genius of each race. Thus shall Canada march forward in step, strong and united towards the great destiny which Providence appears to have ordained for us.